Praise the Lord. Let's rise up to pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness, your power. Thank you for your presence here. We're asking, Lord, that your word will reach every heart in Jesus' name. And today will be a day of blessing, every form of blessing for everyone. We're asking, Lord, open all our hearts, touch our hearts, transform our hearts, transform our lives to meet with you and to meet with all the goodness of the Lord in our lives in Jesus' name. Confirm your blessing of heaven on everyone without exception. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the good people of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can see them today. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Reading from verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do, to observe, and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth and then in verse 2 he tells us and all these blessings shall come upon thee upon me and overtake thee if, if, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then in verse 3, he tells us, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. And then it says in verse 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head, the head, the head I think I need to explain that when it says the head you know when you think of the head that's where all blessings all things that we do that's where it comes from if the, if the head is dull life will be dull if the head is a kind of retarded dull weak not having ability to learn and to retain life will be shallow but when you have a good head i'm talking about you and when you have a brilliant head i'm talking about you today it says it shall not be like you know the head is down and you cannot give control and command to the rest of the body I'm praying that our people here, there, everywhere, wherever you are, the Lord will make you the head. Yeah. Now, now, if the Lord is going to make you the head, you must not lose your head. Once you lose your head, you have lost everything. The head, in control of the whole body, in control of life in control of progress in control of every good thing the lord has said before you lose your head and you lose everything else that's why people when they watch you you take this action you take this action and they know that the way you are going you're likely to end in the ditch and you know it's because of things happening around you. That's why your head is here, your head is there, your head is there, your head is there. You say, man, be careful. Don't lose your head. And you say, woman, look at your family. And look at things you are doing. Don't lose your head. And I want to tell the church, whatever happens around you, whatever does not happen around you, just, just look and see. Just wait and see. Everything will soon be all right. Yeah. And so, don't lose your head. Tell the person by your side, look at them. Don't lose your head. Now, in the Christian life, when we say head, H, holiness. 
Don't lose your holiness. Once you lose your holiness, you've lost the edge. And you've lost the edge, the cutting edge, where God is sending you. E, don't lose your excellence. If you are excellent, then be moving on and be moving up and be progressing every time. You know, once you lose your excellence, you know, something happens. Let's say you're a good a kind of a good engineer and the people who are walking around you they, they do something like this and all that you say what, what about okay if that's the case then let's drop the excellence that we have been pursuing and once you do that the people don't know the reason why you're no more excellent you're no more extraordinary they think it's your fault they don't think it's the fault of the people around you your head your holiness and your excellence don't lose your anointing if you happen to be a preacher if you happen to be a christian if you happen to be a believer there is an anointing upon you and if you are not going to lose your head you'll not lose your holiness you will not lose your excellence it is for the anointing you'll not lose your anointing now people are known for distinctives you look at Moses and the rod in his hand, you can know that's his distinctive. And then you look at Joshua and you look at him saying, Son, stay there. That's his own peculiar uh, distinctive. You don't find any other person doing that. And then you look at Isaiah and you find him saying, Go tell Ezekiah that man Sennacherib that is coming it will not go back by the same way and then 185 soldiers were killed in one night you don't find that with everybody every preacher every pastor every prophet and every professional everyone has his distinctives and so when he says he'll make you the head it's not just talking about head it's talking about your holiness without holiness no man shall see the lord he's talking about excellence that's what daniel had he had an excellent spirit and then your anointing and your distinctive so the lord will make you the head a good amen. amen and remember don't lose your head holiness excellence anointing distinctive i'm looking at verse 13 and the lord shall make thee the head and not the tail and thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath if thou shalt hack him unto the commandments of the lord thy god which i command thee this day to observe and to do them amen today we're talking on the complete possession of our covenant blessings the complete possessions of our covenant blessings three things we're looking at look at number one here number one the conditional promise from our covenant benefactor he benefits us he is our benefactor and he gives us a covenant and from him we have the promises attached to the covenant but those promises as you look at them very closely and as you look at them wanting to possess them and wanting to preserve them in your life those promises of the covenant are conditional number one the conditional promise from our covenant benefactor number two is the conferred privilege of covenant keeping believers the believers who look at the covenant of god and they look at the conditions and they want to have the privilege of having the fulfillment the conferred privilege of covenant keeping believers number three is the courageous prayer of all covenant keeping 
beneficiaries. The, the prayer will pray, not, not the ground level prayer, and not the ordinary prayer, not the usual prayer, not the repeated prayers we have always prayed. Every time we pray, we start the same way and go on, asking the same thing and ending up the same way. Whatever message we hear, and whatever challenge we have, and whatever new conviction God plants in our heart, we keep on praying the same. Not that kind of prayer, courageous prayer of all the covenant keeping beneficiaries. Let's come to number one. Number one is the conditional promise of our covenant benefactor. We're looking at Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. As you look at all these verses we're going to look at here, you'll find the word if. That's the condition. If you do this, then I will do that. If, if the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, if he does this, then I, the Almighty, I will do this. You're looking at divine human partnership and relationship. And God says the covenant, and he says, if the human on earth will do this, then I in heaven, this is what I will do. Notice that word in your Bible. Every time you read a promise, every time you read whatever God has said that He will do, you look at that word. A. Look at Exodus now. Exodus chapter 19. We're reading from verse 5. Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine he wants to lift you up above all the people you know all the people around you all the people in your immediate circle of a relationship yet it says I want to lift you up. I can do it. That's what I want to do. That's my will. And that's my passion for you. But there is a condition. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the others may look at verse 6. In verse 6, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Uh, look at uh, chapter 23, Exodus 23. We're looking at verse 22. In Exodus 23, verse 22, but if you see that, it's conditional. We cannot just come and say, God bless me, bless me, bless me. And the Lord will say, my son, my daughter, obey me, obey me, obey me. And then you say, God, forget about that. I don't have intention to obey. I don't have intention to live a righteous life. I don't like holiness, but I love healing. And then God says, now, you want to make me your servant. Go ahead and bless me. Go ahead and heal me. Go ahead and do that. Promote me. But you are not willing to look at the condition. He says, Abe, thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak. Then I will be an enemy to thine enemies and an adversary to thine adversaries. Then in verse 23, it tells us, it says, for mine angel, capital A, mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Verse 24, in verse 24 it says, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt surely, utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. That's a condition. You're not in partnership with unbelievers or sinners. 
with rebellious people with disobedient people and with the people that take themselves as an idol you're not supporting their idol worship and you're not supporting their hero worship you support the word of God and you support Christ the very son of God you will not bow down to anyone's image Nebuchadnezzar's image or Pharaoh's image if you'll be obedient to the word of the Lord, then he says, this is what you'll look at, verse 25, in verse 25, and ye shall serve the Lord thy God. You don't serve yourself. When you are happy, you render a good service. When you are not happy, then you render a kind of worthless service. You are not serving God, you are serving self. And the condition of self, and the condition of your body, and the condition of your family determines the kind of service you render. That's not serving God, but it says that you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee remember if you obey his voice in Deuteronomy chapter 7 I'm reading from verse 12 Deuteronomy chapter 7 we're looking at verse 12 if ye look at that if the conditions are always there and if you just rush ahead rush ahead pray 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 and then you know prayer is the key obedience is the key following after the lord and fulfilling the condition is the key the, you know, the deceivers were well, that kind of singing, praise the key, praise the key. Uh, Jesus prayed in the morning, prayed, I don't pray everywhere. Prayer is the key. Sinners pray. Prayer is not their key. Repentance is their key. And church people pray. Prayer is not the key. Obedience is the key. It says, wherefore it shall come to pass. If ye hearken to these judgments, undo them that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which is swear unto thy fathers. In verse 15, it says in verse 15, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Give me a good amen there and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee, but he will lay them upon them that hate thee. Another amen. amen. Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, and it shall come to pass, if thou, if thou, if thou, Thou. I wonder why people who read the Bible and they say they are in a Bible believing church. I wonder why and how they will meet the condition and they take away that if. And then they go to the rest of the verse. They're looking for the blessing of Moses upon the action of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They're looking for the blessings of the obedient and faithful apostles. And they're living the life of an apostate who can't do that. That if is very important at a time like this when we're considering the covenant of the Lord. It says very clearly there and it shall come to pass if thou not they forget about what they do if you are looking for the blessing of God if you are searching that the blessings of God will be upon you if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. Now, the church is um, a nation. That's what you find in the New Testament. It's made us a holy nation. And so, we can think of this church and say, this is a holy nation. We can think about another church 
whatever the name, nation, nation, nation now. All those churches, nation, nation, nation. The reason God will bless any church, any gathering, any assembly is if thou shalt hacking diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all the commandments which I command thee this day. But now our members, ministers, workers, leaders, sometimes we have to be uh, not really that we're you know going to the other place or that church to go and borrow anything or kind of transplant anything to deeper life but maybe somebody is doing something and we have to go there an event is happening maybe sometimes we just have to go there and then we see something there and then you see it looks like these people they are not totally following everything you think like that at first and then later you think, okay, if that church is doing that, why are we not doing it? The reason we are do not doing it is because our blessing does not depend on copying this church, copying that church, copying that church. Our blessing, conditional blessing, you know, conditional promise, conditional power, and conditional outpouring, overflowing blessing of God is if thou shalt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all that, not all that we see over there, all that we sense over there, all that we hear those other people are doing, it is if we do all this commandment which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations all the churches, all the gatherings, all the fellowships. Now, if everybody lowers the standard, every church, including Deep Alive, if we lower the standard and we're not thinking of the coming of the Lord, we're not thinking of the rapture, we're not thinking of what it takes to make it to heaven. And we're now at the same level, the world will be trampling over us will not have any distinction, any difference between us and the world. And what happens to the world that God said, I will not put the diseases of the world of Egypt upon you. Then we we'll find the same disease of the world rampant among us. Why? Because we're not noticing the condition and we're not distinguishing ourselves. We lose our head. We lose our holiness. We lose our excellence, what people know us for. We lose our anointing, the anointing that breaks every yoke. We lose our distinctives. And then we're just like sure the other people and the cockroaches and the serpents and the you know, reptiles of a crawling over us. God forbid in Jesus' name. And it says, and it shall come to pass, it thou shalt hack him diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high Somebody who is saved has to be higher than somebody who is a sinner. Somebody who is sanctified has to be higher than the one who is only saved. And somebody who is spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost, has to be higher than the person who is just saved and sanctified. That edge must be there. And that promotion should be there. And that advance, advancement should be there. And it says, I lift you high above all the nations of the earth. And then in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If that word is there again. The condition is always there. When you are praying, if you have prayed and prayed and prayed and there's no answer, go back and check up. Am I omitting the condition? Is there something from the Lord I'm not carrying out? The way I ought to carry out is my heart departed from the Lord? Is my life kind of trampling down upon the word of God? It's as we check the condition. Whether we're fulfilling the 
the condition or not it has we check all the things that precede the fulfillment of the promise of God that we find out if I am not keeping to that in small things in big things you know some people say you know there's not a big deal I know this is not right but this is small I know this is not right but this is small I know that's not right but this is small my brother have you ever considered my sister have you ever considered that the lion does not kill thousands in a year in our continent Africa but the mosquito this one doesn't matter if I do my hand like that the mosquito is gone and yet that small thing kills millions of people all over the world with that malaria you go to this place they say this one is malaria this one is typhoid you go to another place that one is malaria that is typhoid where do we get the malaria and how is malaria killing so many people more than a lion will kill more than an elephant will kill big big sins don't come away most of the time if the little mosquito sin if the little thing doesn't matter doesn't matter doesn't matter that's what kills our spiritual lives and that's what takes the blessings away from us that's why he's saying look at the condition look at what god is saying and look at those little little foxes that spoil the vine it says all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hack him unto the voice of the lord thy God. And then we're looking at uh, verse 6 there. Look at verse 6. It says in verse 6, Blessed shall thou be when thou comest and when thou goest out. And then in verse 7, it says, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God. God giveth thee, verse 9, in verse 9, that Lord shall establish thee and holy people, not just rich people, holy people, not just successful farmer, holy people, and it's not just progressive professional, he wants to establish us that will be holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou if thou if thou shalt keep the commandments of the lord thy god and walk in his ways verse 10 verse 10 says and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the lord and they shall be afraid of verse 11 in verse 11 it says and the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee and then in verse 12 it says the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure and the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in a season and to bless all the work of thine hand and thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow remember that if if you don't bribe if you are not fraudulent if you are not a seed clever seed that will steal either from the office or will steal from the company or will steal in a dexterous way that nobody will know nobody will even suspect that that man that woman can be a seed if you are not stealing if you are not fraudulent if you are not playing internet fraud if you are not doing any of the things that the egyptians the world that they are doing it says hey thou 
shall be obedient to the word of the Lord your God, then he will bless you above all the people that are stealing, all the people that are fraudulent. He will bless you above them in Jesus' name. And thou shalt not borrow, but will lend unto many people. But remember the eighth, look at verse 13. In verse 13, and the Lord shall make thee the head, holiness, excellence, anointing, distinctive. If a head is not distinctive, that's no head. If the head is a mediocre, that's not a head. If the head, so to say, is not anointed, and he doesn't have the courage, the passion, the power. He doesn't have the spiritual strength. That's not a head. If a head is rolling in every time, you know, something happens, he doesn't have the self-control. He doesn't have the self-discipline. He doesn't have the mastery over where he is and the surrounding. That's not a head. If the head is timid and afraid every time, and the little, little, puny pygmies can intimidate him or her, that's not a head. It's when somebody is lifted up by the Lord and then the Lord makes him a real head and you can tell that's a head. I'm pointing at you. I said you can tell that's a head. That's when somebody is a head. Well, if somebody is like, you know, ordinary, you can push there, push there, trampled upon, things will change in your life. It says, the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath if, that's the condition, if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. Verse 14, in verse 14, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, and to the right hand or to the left to go after all the gods to serve them. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hack him unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I commanded this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. You see the two sides. God is a good God, great God, balanced if you obey, these are the blessings that will follow. If you disobey, no matter who you are, your name, your stature, your standing, and whatever I've done for you in the past, no matter who you are, it says for the children of Israel, if you will not act in, if you will not obey, this is what will come. I pray we we'll position ourselves in the place of blessing all the time in Jesus' name. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. We're reading from verse 16. It says, Wash you, the dirty hands, wash you, the dirty habits, wash you, the dirty environments, wash you, the dirty clothing, wash you. It says, wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. And then in verse 17, it says, learn to do well. Learn to do well. Learning takes effort. Learning takes concentration. Learning takes perseverance. Look at when we went to school, we tried to learn the alphabets. They were strange, but we still kept on until we could master those alphabets. We learned the words. Difficult, but we made it. We learned construction of sentences. 
difficult we made it we learned writing an essay composition we made it eventually and we learned a lot of things but learning takes effort it takes the mind it takes the heart i am going to learn why did we learn because you know our difficult subjects were to learn because we looked at the future our future when we finish school our future when we graduate and because we're looking at the future i want to come out of this institution school primary secondary tertiary university college i want to come out of this with a certificate that's why we persevered now it says learn to do well and sometimes you know our bad our old bad habits will try to come back but we'll say no i'm going to learn i'm going to persevere i'm going to be diligent why we're looking at the future the future in heaven we want to come out of this earth with a do well certificate with a well done certificate that we know we came to this life we got saved and then we learned to do what's right according to what a child of God ought to do and then we also got sanctified and the sanctified life we have to persevere we have to focus and we have to resist temptation so as to keep to the learning of God the experience of God in salvation sanctification it takes focus it takes a mind it takes something that says i'm looking at the head i'm looking at the time i leave this earth you leave college and then you go to the next level you go to heaven that's why it says learn to do well and seek judgment and relieve the oppressed and judge the fatherless and plead for the widows then it says in verse 18 in verse 18 it says come now and let us reason together says the lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow and though they be red like crimson they shall be as well. look at verse 19 if if, if ye be willing and obedient all that he has told us to do that's the way of blessing and that's the way of receiving the good good things he has promised in the covenant if ye be willing and obedient ye shall eat the good of the land somebody say good amen, amen. look at verse 20 there in verse 20 but if ye refuse look at god he says if you be willing and obedient at god can you force us to be to be obedient he says no i won't force anything can't you make us obedient i've given you the grace once you are saved you can do it i've given you the anointing if you're a child of God, you can do it. The, the anointing remains. If you want to obey, the strength is there. If you have the heart to obey, you'll find the strength is there to obey. So if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of them. But you have your choice. You're a free moral agent. You can obey, you can disobey. But there is consequence for obedience, there's consequence for disobedience. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be destroyed, devout with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Point number two, we're looking at the conferred privilege of covenant keeping believers the people who believe in the lord and they show it they believe in the lord and they have the evidence of that faith in the lord the privilege that comes on them and the privilege that is conferred upon them look at genesis chapter 22 we're reading from verse 17 that in blessing i will bless thee and in multiplying i will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies why 
on what grounds look at verse 18 it says in verse 18 and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because 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 it's not because you know that's what god said they will do whether you are right or wrong, I'll still do it. Whether you are up or down, I'll still do it. Whether you are right, whether you are righteous or righteous, I'll still do it. No. It says, this I will do because thou hast obeyed my voice. Because thou hast obeyed my voice voice look at psalm 91 in psalm 91 we're reading from verse 7 a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come near thee amen you know for the children of israel millions of them they came out of egypt not one person feeble among their tribes how and it says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions why there is a because there's a reason why look at our church and look at all our brethren here in lagos in all the districts and look at all the states and all the regions and all the congregations and look at how many they are and think of them no evil no sickness no infirmity and no destruction coming upon anyone in jesus name is it possible I said, is it possible if we fulfill his condition? A thousand of outsiders shall fall by thy side, and ten thousand of religious, formal, traditional worshippers, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. In verse 8, it says in verse 8, only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. In verse 9, it says, because, because, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation you have made the lord the bridegroom our savior our provider you have made him our shepherd your habitation now let, let's say for example your husband was physically with you and then there's uh, one refrag one person somewhere coming to make advances to you and your husband is there looking at you and you're looking at your husband even a sinner generally generally would a sinner sinning woman yield to that person that is asking for the lust of the flesh while the husband is there they are not talking not to talk of a believer now, if the Lord is really there, your habitation, if your shepherd is also there, your habitation, if you're conscious that your husband, the bridegroom, is there, and all these people having the works of the flesh, and they're making advances to you, if you're conscious that the Lord is present there physically, will you respond? Tell me. But you know, if a so-called believer is yielding to whatever, works of the flesh, activities of sin, and is doing things that should not see the light of day, he has not made the most high his habitation. And because he has not made the Lord his habitation, and he's acting as if God does not exist, the man is an atheist. The woman, church man, church woman, is an atheist. He doesn't believe that God sees what he's doing. 
he knows the word of God in the head but he doesn't have the heart to be obedient to the Lord he has not made the Lord the most high his habitation that's why those things are happening look at verse 10 in verse 10 there shall no evil befall thee neither shall any play come near the dwelling in verse 12 it tells us in verse 12 it says they shall bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone are you following yeah. evil or the devil has placed a stumbling block and you are walking and walking if you're obedient to the lord if you're a child of god you may not see that stumbling stone but the lord has seen that stumbling stone and because you obey him and because you make god your habitation he will send his angel before you get to that stumbling block the angels will lift you up yeah. but if you are disobedient if you are rebellious if you are sinful if you are habitually unrighteous and the stumbling block is there that you might stumble your health might go your property might be lost god sees the stumbling block there but the condition he gave you are not obeying and you're just walking here there and backsliding sinning or unrighteous and all that he will not send the angel it is because we obey him it is because we trust his word it is because we obey his word implicitly that's what he said then if you're obedient and you make the lord your habitation they shall bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against this to look at verse 13 in verse 13 thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder young lion the young guy and the dragon thou shalt trample on the feet then in verse 14 is it because look at that because because he has set his love upon me therefore will i deliver him therefore because he sets his love upon me and because if you love somebody you will regard him you will honor him you will obey him we obey out of love if we don't obey and we just say i love you i love you i love you that one that one is just what that one is not real it says because he has set his love upon me therefore will i deliver him i will set him on high because it very quickly it tells us i'm saying this to the people who honor him i'm saying this to the people who obey god i'm saying this to the people who reverence and respect him it says because he has no not my name then in verse 15 it says he shall call upon me and i will answer that's the covenant he says because you set your love upon him because you make him your habitation because you're obedient to him and because you're born again and you show the evidence of being born again he said because of that he shall call upon me and i will answer him i will be with him in trouble and i will deliver him and honor him somebody shout amen, amen. first kings chapter 11 and i'm reading from verse 9 first kings 11 reading from verse 9 and the lord was angry with solomon because because that the solomon is said you have asked the things that please me because of that i'll make you rich because of that i'll set you on high because of that i'll do this and i'll give you wisdom that no king before you has ever had and even people after you you'll be special because your prayer pleased me but now 
the Lord, that same God that was happy with him, that same God that blessed him, that same God that promoted him, the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Look at the favor that Solomon had had and look at the relationship and the interaction between him and the Lord. Look at the great blessings the Lord had given him. But now he took things for granted. Wisdom that he had. Knowledge that he had. Favor that he had. Blessings that he had. Now the Lord had given him blessings. But now, as he took everything for granted and went to marry strange wives and followed after their gods and their idols, King Solomon. And because of all that he did and his riches, he used his money, spent his money to build for the gods and the idols of those concubines. It says now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was torn from the Lord, the God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Some people think the love of God is unconditional. They think he loves you, loves you forever. Fall into the ditch, he loves you forever. Go into the far country, he loves you forever. Help and age idol worshippers to worship their idols, he loves you forever. And take the people who are disobeyed, denying God, publicize them, he loves you forever. He doesn't work that way. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was torn from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice in verse 10. Verse 10 then tells us, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. And then now he tells us in verse 11. In verse 11 it says, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Solomon, come, I want to talk to you. Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant, conditional covenant, Solomon, you of all people, wise, intelligent, rich, and you have the strength to do this, and you can read, you can write, and I commanded you this, and look at the direction you are going. It says, you have not followed my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded thee. I will surely rent, tear, take away the kingdom from thee, and will give it unto thy servant. One servant. He had a servant that was good, sharp, intelligent, forthright, and powerful. And so the Lord said, he had the ability to rule the nation, even though it's your servant. I'm not going to give everything now to you. I'm going to give part of that kingdom unto thy servant. What did Solomon do? Did Solomon say, okay, it's God, I'm sorry. I cost this for myself. I'm sorry that I'm losing my privilege. I repent. We don't know what God would have done if he had repented. What he do? Look at verse 40. In verse 40, Solomon sought, therefore, therefore, because God had pointed to him that, look at that servant, because of what you have done, because of disobedience, and because of the rebellion, I'm going to give part of, that, of the kingdom to that servant. Therefore, Solomon sought to kill Jeroboam. He said, ah, that's the one God you are mentioning. Okay, before you allow him to rule and take my place, I will kill him. That's not the attitude we're to have. 
when God is correcting us and is saying my covenant is still there my promises are still there but you're losing it because of this and because of that okay now I'm going to put that person in your place and if that is the case I'll kill that man I'll dribble him I'll torture him I will make him to even forget how to use his intelligence I might not be able to kill him physically but I'll kill him psychologically I kill him spiritually. I use whatever they use to you know, confuse the man. How are you going to do that? Look, that's what Solomon did. It says, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt. God, I want to accept the promise to be a king. Like you said, you'll give to him, but the man wants to kill me and he ran away. How do you, how do you send people away from the church? They are coming to be blessed by God to do that and then you do your maneuvering and then you send them away, they run away from the church and there's a man that you know, knew the Bible knew the word of God, knew the promises of God and knew the covenant of God what's your goal, what are you doing, why are you in the church, that the people that should do this and do that you have something, to, you have you know, conspiracy and whatever and then they run away from the church, we shouldn't do that, it did not benefit so Solomon. And then you say that man was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Solomon did not reconcile with God after God said, you're not keeping my covenant. You're not obeying me. This is what I said I will do. I told David, if your children will walk after me, I will make up their children to take over the throne. Solomon, you spoiled the whole covenant. And I'm angry with you. And the man did not repent. He was in that anger, pursuing the servant to kill that servant until he died what shall it profit a man if he shall gain all the knowledge all the authority all the power on earth and lose his own soul in john chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 31 john chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 31 it tells us it said then said jesus to those jews which believed on him if that's the condition we believe in him now if and it says if he continue in my word then shall he be my disciples indeed what are the words of jesus anyone that will humble himself like this little child shall be exalted if you continue in my word anyone that exalts himself will be abased if you continue in my word and if you are bringing your gift to the altar you remember that somebody has ought he gives you leave your gift at the altar it's not about activity about duty about this and that leave your gift go reconcile what's your brother who has something good that's christianity that's the word of christ it says if you continue in my word blessed are the pure in heart not the people that uh, you know kind of uh, money doing this and doing that pure in heart for they shall see the lord that's the word of the lord except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees he shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven that's the word of christ if you continue in my word ye hypocrites you appear righteous externally but inwardly you're ravening wolves that's the word of christ are we going to remain in hypocrisy all our lives what are we trying to achieve it says then jesus said to those jews which believed on him if ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed and in verse 32 and it says and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Amen. You shall know the truth. Why doesn't the truth make us free? Because we know the truth in the head, not in the heart. We know the truth, we learn the truth, we hear the truth, we increase in the knowledge of the truth. Why doesn't it change our lifestyle? Why doesn't it bring a life that is shining for the glory of God? We know that truth in the head. We have not transferred it to our hearts. And we're not looking for transforming truth. 
and our lives are not transparent if we really know the truth in our heart if we know the truth and we're devoted to the truth and we're not devoted to tradition we're not devoted to you know what people want us to do if we really knew the truth the truth will make us free it will make us free in jesus name even if we do less less if you have, have been doing 10 things, sweating, walking, putting all your strength or your skill into it, 10 things, but it's on the platform of hypocrisy, lying, deception, jolting other people, deceiving other people, destroying the lives of other people, scattering the families of other people. You're doing 10 things. All those 10 things, they mean nothing to God. But we know the truth now. What is important is my heart to God, my life to God, my devotion to God, my transparency before God. And even if I do less, I do six things, I drop one, two, three, four. Because much of those things, if they had been like just wanting recognition, I drop them. I do less. The less that you do in transparency of life, the less that you do in a life that is acceptable in the sight of God will be so much blessed for you and for the people you are ministering for. That's why we're not looking at activity, 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 and the hypocrisy is falling out of the activity. The righteousness is underneath the activity. The insincerity is underneath the activity, and the destruction of other people's lives following the activity. Stop that, stop that, and do less. And then, when you do that less in truth, and you do that less uh, number of things in total transparency unto God and you remember God in everything you do the blessings for people that you are ministering to because the spirit will back up the, what you are doing the power will back up what you are doing the anointing will back up what you are doing you become free you make other people free and everybody will enjoy the blessings of the Lord in their lives in Jesus name ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you tell me free look at point number three here point number three we're looking at the courageous prayer of all covenant keeping beneficiaries as i told you earlier prayer is very important but prayer is not the key the prayer of faith the faith that stems out of obedience that the prayer that the key not every prayer when we pray and underneath that prayer there is obedient heart underneath that prayer there's a sincere heart underneath that prayer there is a focused heart on the honor of god that the prayer god recognizes we're looking at first kings chapter 18 verse 21 first kings 18 verse 21 and elijah came unto all the people and said how long all ye between two opinions if the lord be god follow him but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Elijah came and said, Three years of famine have come and gone. Well, the fourth year of famine. And that fourth year of famine, about half of the year has gone already. And now we're still like this. Look at the famine. Look at the suffering. Look at the dead. Look at the sicknesses. Baal has not helped the nation. Your hypocritical service has not helped the nation. Your disobedient life has not helped the situation now. If God be God, let's follow him. And if Baal, follow him. They couldn't answer. And then 
uh, Elijah made a proposal. Let these prophets of Baal, let them take up a bullock and pray, but not put fire. And then I will do my own. Whichever God brings the fire, that the God we are going to serve. I didn't hear you. And so those, you know the story already, I don't need to read it to you. Those uh, people, they did all they wanted to do. They caught themselves, they shouted, they ran, and all, nothing happened. So Elijah said, come aside. And then he set the altar right. He said, put water. They put water. The water that should not even allow the fire to come up. And now a courageous prayer. He said, God, the God of heaven. I come because of these people and before he finished the prayer the fire came down a courageous prayer nobody had ever prayed a kind of prayer like that before in the whole Bible and yet this man had the courage to pray that kind of prayer and God answered the prayer if we're obedient to the Lord saved and sanctified our prayers will be answered. After that, he dealt with the, um, those people, false prophets. Then he told Ahab, he said, prepare your chariot. And this man Elijah, courageous prayer, showers, rain that had not come for three and a half years. He prayed and then he told the servant, go and see. The servant said, I see nothing. Why didn't you see anything? Are you one of those people that don't believe? Go and see again. He came back the seventh time. He said, now I can see. You will see the hand of God. Yeah. Fire came. The rain came. Courageous prayer. Look at the next one there. That's in First Samuel. I'm reading from chapter 7, verse 8. The people of Israel, they had gone away from the Lord again and the children of Israel said unto Samuel cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines look at verse 9 in verse 9 it tells us and Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord and Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel and the Lord heard him the Lord will hear him look at verse 10 it says when the Lord heard him and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them and there was meeting before Israel. You lost your amen. Samuel prayed. And all those Philistines, they had the ammunition and the weapons and everything. Look at Israel, almost like having nothing. But just pray. courageous prayer that Samuel prayed. Immediately, the Lord sent his thunder, scattered those people and destroyed those people. God can do that again. He says, I am God, I change not. Why do we pray, pray and pray? An ordinary headache is not healed. Why do we pray, pray and pray? An ulcer has continued for six, seven years and the ulcer is still there. Why do we pray, pray and pray? And this one is dying of cancer. That one is becoming blind at a young age. That one is having leukemia, you know, at young age. And we pray, pray and pray and we fast. And things are not happening. They are happening everywhere. They are happening where we go. They are happening on the side there. I can tell you, you know, testimonies of things happening that you didn't hear even hear about because after the crusade they sent back to me and they say this happened this happened this happened even to people in other places in other religions spectacular things and special things and spiritual things and supernatural things happening everywhere but we at home let's talk to ourselves are we going to continue like this what's in our hand what's in our lives 
And what's uh, happening to us that all these good things are happening to other people? And uh, when we go there, just once in a while and over here, it appears that the skies are sealed. It's because we have not responded to the word of God like we ought to. Things will change in our prayer life. So that as we are obedient to the Lord while we are yet speaking, like Samuel, he'll send the thunder, it will disperse all those demons in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 12. We're reading from verse 5. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the Lord unto God for him. Peter, the forefront apostle. James already gone, and Herod thought Peter is next. And he will not escape this. And so he put him in prison. The day he was to touch him, bring him out, kill him, destroy him, forget about him, and then scatter the church. Herod is not powerful enough to scatter the church. Upon this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell, not only one gate, all the gates of hell, with Herod, with Pharaoh, with Pilate, everyone, shall not prevail against the church. The church that runs the agenda of God cannot be destroyed by men on earth that have earthly agendas. And a Christian that follows the agenda of God will not be destroyed by any man any woman, any group of people having a human agenda in Jesus' name. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And then we're reading there from verse 7. In verse 7, behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter, is to wake him up, not to kill him, smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Understand, Peter was chained to soldiers. Those soldiers were supposed to be watching him so he doesn't escape. And the chain made of iron rings, if anybody moves, the chain will make sound. And because they are chained on this side, chained on that side, there's no way he could have escaped. But the angel came and smote him, tapped him, and he woke up, and the chain, chains, plural, fell off from his hands. The soldier here did not hear the sound of the chain. The soldier here did not hear the sound of the chain. And then they didn't sense any movement. And the angel said, put on your sandals put on his sandals and they did each wake up and the chain in their hand became heavier because the chain was now only in their hands that didn't affect them they kept on sleeping that's how they are keep on sleeping and then the angel said come on and then he came but there is God you know God you know what they do one standing at that door one standing at and they fully armed anything even if a rat passes that soldier is there or kill the rat but 
as Peter and the angel got to the door, the door opened by itself. Amen. Amen. The padlock opened. Everything they have padlocked before you were open up to you. And then the door, iron door, iron door, the iron door opened and Peter went out and he came to the second iron door and again it opened automatically. Heaven does not need the key to that padlock. It's the creator of all things and that padlock will open in Jesus' name. The enemy might have locked you up. And then they have guards that intimidate with everything they have. And as you are to come out, just looking at their faces will make you shrink and will make you turn back and say, Angel, go. I prefer to stay in this dungeon than see those angels, than see those uh, people, those guards, and look at what they have in hand. The Lord will close their eyes to you. And the Lord will close your eyes to them. The second gauge, they came and they passed on. I am moving on. I am moving on. And then Peter realized this is deliverance. He thought he was dreaming. This one is not a dream. What will happen in your life? Good, good things. You will think you are dreaming. It will not be a dream. It will be reality in Jesus' name. Then he came out that same chapter. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, that same chapter 12, upon his search day, Herod, that the one who imprisoned Peter, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon the throne and made an oration unto them. Verse 22, in verse 22, and the people gave a shout. That's what the people do. They praise the bad man. They humiliate the good man. They exalt the destroyer. And they destroy the developer. That's what they do. The world has not changed. And they said, it is the voice of a God and not of a man verse 23 and immediately the angel of the lord the angel that delivered peter out of that dungeon that same angel came back now the angel of the lord smote him he smote peter and peter arose he smote herod the same hand herod gave up the ghost because he gave not God the glory and he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost the angel of the Lord is there for you he will act positively yeah. and the angel of the Lord is still there for them he will act destructively yeah. we're looking at chapter 13 of Acts Acts chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 3. In verse 3, and when that fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Look at verse 8. As they sent them away, they went in ministry. And the ministry they went for now, in verse 8, and Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation. We stood them. Oh, there are people, they don't fear anybody, fear Barnabas or fear Paul. They don't fear any preacher, any pioneer, anyone. They are just bold to their destruction. It says this in Lymas, a sorcerer. When somebody is doing evil, and is able to do that evil for a long, long time, 
and people don't even realize the deputy did not realize this man has another subterranean power and hindering him from getting life eternal why don't you understand that there are people like that they have this power underneath occultic evil sorcery it says the sorcerer for so is his name by interpretation and his action is also like that we stood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith and then in verse 9 here is what we are talking about courageous prayer and here it was the first time of Paul and Barnabas on the field where they went and yet when this evil man with evil spirit with evil power with evil intention with evil agenda when he confronted them were told then Saul who is also called Paul filled with the Holy Ghost set his eyes on him you know many believers the first thing you do is somebody has you know that kind of occulty power that kind of evil power that kind of spiritual power that kind of gang uh, power if they have that and you happen to know and they are in oppression they are in oppression then you you drop your head you only what you like do your head is scattered you are confused when you have the spirit of god and you're obedient to god and you are partakers of the benefit of the covenant you look straight and you look at them and the fire from the spirit in you will burn off the power in them in jesus name. it says then saul who is called paul filled with the holy ghost set his eyes on him and then in verse 10 it says and said O full of all subtlety and all mischief thou child of the devil that's how you pray when you're praying courageous prayer you don't you know parambulate and say this one say it that way as if you're afraid to say the right thing i don't want them to hear what i have in mind and then god understands that then you pray a kind of prayer that has no energy and no spirit no punch in any life it says thou child of the devil thou enemy of all righteousness will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the lord then in verse 11 he says and now behold the hand of the lord is upon thee and thou shalt be blind paul you are coming here for the first time and you're talking to a man thou shalt be blind what if you didn't become blind what if God does not answer that kind of prayer? Would they not say that you are, you know, you don't have power? This man has power. Be careful how you deal with the situation. Look at Paul. This is what, why we call it courageous prayer. The courageous prayer of all covenant keeping beneficiaries. It said, Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season and immediately. That's how God will answer your prayer. Immediately. I said that's how God will answer your prayer. We have more power if we're obedient to the Lord, if we're saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. We have more power than those people hiding in the village and they're trying to throw something spiritually, you know, across the seas and they're trying to throw to anybody here before it gets there to return to them. It says immediately they are fell on him a mist and a darkness. And they went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. I hope you understand. The man lost his sight immediately. The man lost his job immediately. He went out. He couldn't stay with the deputy anymore without even disengaging him and without stopping his service there. No use again. Number one, he has lost his power. He has lost his occultism. He has lost his sight. He lost his job. And he lost the respect he used to have from the deputy. That man used to look at him up there as the power that be. It is lost everything. All those people that 
right to fight against anyone standing in in the covenant blessing of the lord they will lose everything they have got and then he went out seeking some to lead him by the hand look at verse 12 in verse 12 then the deputy when he saw what was done believed being astonished at the doctrine of the lord we're looking at uh, psalm 50 in psalm 50 we're reading from verse 5 psalm 50 reading from verse 5 it's talking about the people that god is calling he wants them to gather together unto him and to offer a prayer that will not be denied in psalm 50 verse 5 it says gather my saints not sinners not backsliders not hypocrites, not people who are playing religion, not traditional people without the real uh, evidence of salvation and following the Lord. It says, gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant, a covenant with me by sacrifice. Not those who come with empty hands, no sacrifice, empty heart, no surrender, empty life, no submission, empty perception, and no, no yieldedness unto God. Gather my saints unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let's look at verse 15. In verse 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee 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 and thou shalt glorify me look at verse 16 but unto the wicked but unto the people who remain habitually sinners but unto the worshipers who will not change anything but unto the people praying, 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 prayer, 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 prayer is the key. But their lives will not turn around. But unto the wicked, God says, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Wicked, sinful, backsliding will not return will not repent will not make restitution will not turn around their lives to follow the path of righteousness it says what hast thou to do that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth look at verse 17 in verse 17 seeing thou hatest instruction you're only looking for bread and butter. Thou hatest instruction. You're only looking for money. Thou hatest instruction. You're only looking for physical, external blessing. Thou hatest instruction and casteth my words behind thee. Everything we've heard, they cast that behind them. What have you got to do with prayer and covenant when you cast my words behind thee? Verse 18. In verse 18, when thou sawest a thee then thou contendest with him and has been partaker with adulterers when you see thieves they are looking for where to hide their booties oh is i'm here and then you put the thing there thieves they want, they want to put the money you have stolen in one account they'll never discover this put it in my account and then you look at all those things and then it says the adulterers who are partakers of them and you know they get their money through adultery fornication and prostitution and then you get the money and it's offering and it's offering i don't care where they get the offering i'm here you can put the money there if you can put you know ten thousand hundred thousand one million then god will bless you 
and it, but you know what they are doing. You know where they are getting the money and the resources from the dog shall not come into the sanctuary of the Lord. And then you've done all that and then you are praying, praying, praying. God says, stop the prayer. What kind of God do you think I am? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God in heaven. We must appreciate the nature of God, which is the nature of holiness and not just bringing money. What's, what's money going to do? A sinner bringing money for us to use to save sinners and he himself remains a sinner and is coming every month, every year and is not saved. It's not making restitution. He's still doing the evil thing he was doing and the sinner is bringing the money so that we can use the money to save uh, the lost. God doesn't respect that. In verse 19, verse 19 it says, Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit lying. In verse 20 it says, Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. In verse 21 it says, These things thou hast done and I kept silence and thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes look at verse 22 now consider this ye that forget God mention in the name of God you forget God. Coming to the service without straightening out your life, aligning your life with the word of God, you forget God. Doing the same old, rebellious, or righteous, sinful, habitual things that you did before, you're still doing them. It says, ye that forget God, consider this lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Verse 23, in verse 23 whoso offereth praise glorifies me and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God the blessing of God, the goodness of God, the fulfillment of the promise of this, of the covenant of God, it will show us as we turn to him fully and totally, completely, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and we love him without any reservation, even from today, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name! And then we think of all the things the Lord himself has taught us all these many years, everything we've heard that we have dropped by the wayside and we're no more obeying the word of God. We're just living a nominal, shallow life. We're no more deeper life. We're no more higher life, spiritual life. And the life has now become shallow, superficial. We now want to talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I realize you can't repent for another person just like you cannot breathe for another person you cannot drink water on behalf of another person anybody going to breathe to remain alive is going to breathe by himself anyone that is going to eat so as to uh, you know, solve the hunger problem is going to eat for himself anyone who is going to repent who is going to turn around who is going to follow after the Lord and begin a new life in Christ has to do that for himself and the Lord has said anyone that will now glorify him and order his conversation aright, he will show the fullness of the blessing of the salvation of the Lord. I believe it will start from you. I said it will start from you. Rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer, not hypocritical prayer, a prayer of conviction, a prayer in confidence, a prayer in courage, a prayer that stands on the word of God, that obeys the word of God, and then he says, I will answer from heaven. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.